Good morning and welcome to this virtual worship service of St. Paul Lutheran Church. I know how much we would love to be gathered this morning, but with the windshield values being as cold as they are, uh, the best way we can love our neighbor on this day where we celebrate love uh, is to uh, enjoy worship from home. Uh, from the warmth of where we are, we give thanks for the many blessings we have, including our warm homes, our clothes in the closet, our food in the fridge. For These are things that we so often take for granted. So welcome to St. Paul Lutheran from wherever you are today. A few announcements before we begin worship. First, an announcement of praise and joy. We welcome into the St. Paul Lutheran Church family, Isla Ann Tiedemann, uh, daughter of John and Erica Tiedemann. Uh, Isla was born last Tuesday, 8 pounds, 10 ounces, 21 inches long, a healthy and beautiful baby, uh, number five for the Tiedemann family. She comes home and joins uh, very excited brothers and sisters, uh, and mom and dad, uh, mom and baby are doing well. They are healthy, and we praise God uh, for all of these things. A few other announcements before we begin worship this morning. Please note that this Wednesday, the season of Lent begins. We will begin with a 7 o'clock Ash Wednesday worship service here uh, in the sanctuary at St. Paul Lutheran Church. We will enjoy communion and the imposition of ashes as we begin this holy season of the year. Next Sunday, I want you to be aware of two things that were supposed to begin today that we've pushed off a week. Number one, the St. Paul Junior Lutherans will be holding their bake sale. Uh, we hope that you'll join us and uh, buy some treats for you and your loved ones as uh, the Junior Lutherans raise money for their mission trip to Rapid City, South Dakota this summer. Two, we are going to begin a, a hearts and hands collection for the Bishop Dudley Hospitality House in Sioux Falls, uh, which is a homeless shelter that serves the city. Uh, this year of COVID-19 has been difficult on so many organizations on their donations and uh, things that they are bringing in that they need for their facilities. Uh, so we are going to bless them by doing a drive for things like uh, travel or regular sized toiletries, toilet paper, cleaning supplies, body towels, and hand towels. A list of these things can be found in the bulletin up on the website. Uh, also, next Sunday in the afternoon, we'll do movie day at St. Paul Lutheran Church. This is something that we do every February. We get the kids together for some faith-based films. The K through third graders will come at 2.30. Uh, they will enjoy some popcorn and snacks. The junior Lutherans will come at 4 o'clock, and they will enjoy some pizza and snacks. Uh, supper will be provided for them. Please note a few things that are happening this week in our congregation. Bible study will continue through the season of Lent. We will just move that time from 6.30 up to 6 o'clock before our midweek uh, Lenten worship services. Uh, and then men's breakfast. Please remember that we will meet on Friday morning. We'll be starting a new series on the miracles of Jesus uh, in the Fellowship Hall, and we hope to see you there. Those are the announcements, so I ask now that you join me from where you are in our call to worship Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the promise giver, the source of love, our rock and redeemer. Amen. The world knows darkness. Shadows of doubt and fear cloud our lives, yet Christ beckons us into his light. Come, Lord Jesus, lead us. Bring us to your brilliant and majestic glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God and King. Glorious and powerful is the God of all creation. In reverent awe, we worship our God. The Lord our God is King and judge of all things for all eternity, all people and all places. In reverent awe, we praise our God. The God who said, out of the darkness the light dawns, is the same God who made light shine in our sinful hearts to show his radiant glory and majesty in the face of Christ. His light shines in the darkness. We sing our opening hymn on this Transfiguration Sunday, Christ whose glory fills the skies, and we will sing it to the tune of Rock of Ages.
Dear friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The psalmist declares that God who created us, who loves us and redeems us, searches us and knows us completely. So we come to God as one from whom no secrets are hidden to ask for his forgiveness and peace. Even sin and death are not obstacles between us and God. So let us confess our faults, that they may be washed away by the mercy of our risen Lord. And let us spend a few moments in internal examination on those sins that need to be washed away this day and from this week. Gracious God, we confess that we have sinned against you and one another. We are worried and distracted by many things, and we fail to love you above all else. We store up treasures for ourselves and turn away from our neighbors in need. Forgive us that we may live in the freedom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When we were laid low by sin and guilt, God made us alive together with Christ, forgiving us all our trespasses and taking our sins to the cross. Hear the good news of the gospel. In accordance to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ and by his authority alone, I forgive you the entirety of all your sins. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of majesty, through Jesus' transfiguration, you reveal him as your beloved Son. Keep us faithful in the promise that through the cross and the empty tomb, we are joint heirs with Christ and will one day enjoy the fullness of your glory for eternity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, kids who are joining us from home, uh, I was doing some thinking uh, this morning, because today, of course, is Valentine's Day, so I hope you all have Valentine's Day cards made, or maybe you got some flowers or made a little gift for your moms or friends or whoever it may be. I know you all probably had parties in school. We've been doing Valentine's Day cards at home with Jonah. He's been sending some uh, little pictures and gifts out to his grandparents and aunts and uncles, but I was thinking that holidays, like Valentine's Day, are very strange. Because do we only love on Valentine's Day? And I was thinking of, are we only thankful on Thanksgiving? Do we only celebrate Christ's birth at Christmas and his resurrection at Easter? Are these the only times that we can celebrate and enjoy these things? What about Veterans Day or Memorial Day or the 4th of July? Are we only proud to be Americans and thankful for our military men and women on these holidays? And what about Mother's Day and Father's Day? Are we only thankful for our moms and dads on these one day of the year? No. So why do we have holidays? Well, I think we have holidays because we easily forget things. And we get very easily distracted and far too busy. So we need holidays on the calendar that help us to remember some things that we need to be doing. And actually, that's the very reason that we come to church on Sunday mornings or we watch like we are this morning, is we need to be reminded of a few things. Even from week to week, we need to be reminded that God loves us. We need to be reminded that Jesus loves us even though we are sinners. We need to be reminded that because of the cross and because that Jesus Christ went there, we will know eternal life in heaven and we will know that we are God's children. We need to be reminded of these things. But I think holidays aren't just about being reminded. I think holidays are also about action. So on Thanksgiving, we might go around the table and tell 
what we're thankful for. And on Mother's and Father's Day, we might make little things for our parents or write them notes to let them know that we appreciate them. Or on the 4th of July, uh, we sing patriotic hymns and remember that we actually are quite proud to be from this country uh, where we live. So today on Valentine's Day, I'm going to encourage you boys and girls to do three things to listen, to show, and to tell. One, listen today and worship for a word from God into your ears where God says, I love you. I love you today, I'll love you tomorrow, I've loved you since the day I came to you in the waters of baptism. So listen, and then show. Today, find one thing that you can do for someone in your life to show them that you love them. And maybe not just that you love them, but that God loves them too. And then three, tell. I want you to find a different person in your life and just simply say the words, I love you. Simply say, God loves you. Simply say, Jesus Christ loves you. Or otherwise, this day means nothing. So let's take the opportunity this day on Valentine's Day to listen, to show, and to tell. Let's pray. Dear Father, I thank you for the little ears that are listening this morning. And I thank you that you are the one who tells them over and over again that you love them completely through Jesus Christ. Help us to take the love that you have for us and put it to use in the world. Help us to take the love that you have for us and show it to others and to tell others that in you and in the cross and in the empty tomb, we have all the love we need and we love because you first loved us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Judy's going to come and bring the word for us today. Our first reading for today is found in Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 through 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me this consecrated people who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. Our second reading is 2 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 13, and 4, verses 1 through 6. 2 Corinthians 3, starting with uh, verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. And then chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 
For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Here ends our reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, Christ, our Lord and God. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, Christ, our Lord and God. <clears throat> Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace are yours this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. While there are many ways in which I like to pester my wife, perhaps one of my favorite things to do is try to predict how a movie we are watching is going to end, or better yet, if I know what is coming, to give away the plot completely. A few weeks ago, Sarah wanted to watch The Art of Racing in the Rain, a mushy, gushy, feel-good story about an old dog named Enzo who recounts his life with Denny his best friend and owner. It was Sarah's turn to pick the movie, so I didn't have the heart to tell her that I had read the book in high school. But I did have the heart to pester. So all throughout the movie, I started dropping hints and predictions about what I thought was going to happen. And needless to say, we didn't actually get to finish the film, and I slept on the couch. Sarah loves suspense. And Sarah doesn't like spoilers because spoilers take all of the fun out of the guessing and waiting. And that is frustrating. This morning, our Lord Jesus spoils the end of the story for you and me, not to infuriate us, but to bring peace and comfort, which are two things that our friend Peter has been a little short on lately. This morning's gospel text begins in kind of an ominous way, after six days so naturally, the first question becomes, so six days after what? Six days prior to this, we find our Lord Jesus and his disciples walking around Caesarea Philippi when Christ turns to his trusted allies and says, who do people say that I am? And the disciples answer saying that the people around Galilee are calling him another prophet, the reincarnated John the Baptist or Elijah. But then the question becomes more pointed. Forget what other people say. What about you, my friends? Who do you say that I am? And without skipping a beat, Peter makes his famous confession, you are the Christ. You are the promised Savior. You are the long-awaited Messiah. And Jesus affirms him, yes, Peter, on this confession, on the confession that I am the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And immediately, the minds of the disciples start to wander. Like my wife, who sits on the couch and wants nothing more than to begin plotting out what the end of the story might be, the disciples start to meditate on what this means for them. Does this mean that Jesus Christ is the political powerhouse that is going to overthrow the Romans? Does this mean that they will have positions of honor in the king's courts? 
Does this mean they will continue to enjoy the attention and fame they've experienced these past several months as they've journeyed with him from town to town? No, Jesus says. Instead, he brings them back down to earth and lays out the job description of the Messiah, the Savior. And for the first of three times, Jesus foretells his death and resurrection that when they travel to Jerusalem, he will suffer many things. He will be rejected even by them. He will be put to death. But this is not the end of the story that they had contrived in their minds. Peter says, this will never be. And John thinks, how could this ever happen to God's son? And James mutters to himself, but what kind of king is killed by his own people? And for this reason, Jesus must spoil the end of their story. His ending is far better than the ones they have dreamed up. So Jesus takes his inner circle away to interrupt the trailer that is playing in their heads. Dear friends in Christ, we have come to a crossroads Sunday during which we look back at the season of Epiphany and forward towards the season of Lent and we ask the question, what does Jesus' transfiguration mean for us? Well, this morning on the top of the mountain, Peter, James, and John are treated to a big aha moment of Jesus' ministry We've been uncovering these moments in Epiphany ever since the wise men stumbled upon Christ not long after his birth. After that time, Jesus had been revealed as the one who is greater than even his predecessor, John the Baptist. He's been revealed as a man who has great authority over people and sickness and demons. But here is what tripped up the disciples these past several weeks the most. He is man. He is human. This doesn't add up. Until, that is, Jesus unleashes his glory that has been hidden inside his flesh. Not only is he man, but he is God. Not only is he physical, but he is eternal. Not only is he the son of a carpenter. Not only is he a physician and an exorcist, but he is one with the Father completely. And this is displayed in his transfiguration. The word that literally translates in the Greek to metamorphosis. His appearance changes and he becomes dazzling and bright, almost too much for eyes to behold. And as if this moment isn't confirmation enough of Jesus' divinity and humanity. If as if it wasn't enough, Moses and Elijah come to join him. The great lawgiver and the great prophet of the Old Testament saying, we told you he was coming. This is the one that we bore witness to centuries ago. Well, this is almost too much for the disciples to take in. How amazing, I think, it must have been to behold God himself lifting the veil as we read of lifting Moses' veil, to lift the veil between his two humanities, these two humanities of Christ. How amazing it must have been for them to feast their eyes on Jesus Christ, God from God, light from light in shining flesh, showcasing his human nature and his divine nature. But what does the bumbling idiot Peter want to do? He wants to bottle it up. Let's erect three tents here, Jesus. You can dwell forever on this mountain. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. You don't need to die. You can reign from right here. And again, as this happened so often, Peter had to be rebuked. But this time it wasn't a rebuke from Jesus, it was a a rebuke from his father. This is my son, my beloved, listen to him. And in this moment, Peter understood that he was right. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and that cannot be disputed now after this transfiguration experience. But in this moment, Peter also understood that Jesus was right. He cannot stay on this mountain. 
he has to go to Jerusalem. The cross, his suffering, his death, all of these things are unavoidable. Dear hearers of God's holy word, I'm going to give away the end of the story this morning. Jesus Christ did come down off the mountaintop, and in the 40 days that lie ahead of us in the season of Lent, we will follow Jesus as he sets his face toward Jerusalem and the Passion Week that awaits him there. Spoiler alert, the Son of God dies on a cross and is laid in a cold stone tomb for you. Spoiler alert. And here's the plot point that Jesus Christ is really trying to drive home for Peter, James, and John this morning. This isn't the end of his story, and this won't be the end of your story either. Jesus Christ will bust out of the tomb on Easter morning, ascend into heaven, and be seated at the right hand of the Father. But there can be no glory of that day without Golgotha. There can be no resurrection without death. There can be no Easter morning without Good Friday. When the disciples, six days prior to this, had heard about Jesus' impending crucifixion, their minds went crazy. They began to doubt. They began to fear. They began to write the rest of the story for Jesus only without the cross and without the resurrection and without its hope. And so too it is with us. We get distracted by the world. The seed of doubt takes root in our heart. Like the disciples, we think that God has long since forgotten about this old forsaken world, or maybe there isn't even a God at all, given all this suffering that is happening. Certainly, the events of the past few months have given a little bit of evidence to that. We look to the pain of division that is gripping our country, the suffering from the COVID-19 virus and the uncertainty of when life will get back to normal, the hate that has enveloped our world, and we take our eyes off of God's promise. We begin plotting the end for ourselves, trying to figure out how it will all come to pass or what we can do to end or stop it. Spoiler alert. Listen to Jesus Christ. This is the advice of his Father in heaven. When Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you, I will be with you always to the end of the age, listen to him. When Jesus says, I love you and claim you despite all of your faults and failings, listen to him. When Jesus Christ says, take heart, I have overcome the world, I have crushed Satan, I have defeated death, listen to him. On this day, Valentine's Day, when we are celebrating the gift of love, there is no greater display of love than this, no better message that can be scribbled onto a Hallmark card. My love for you, Jesus says, is so strong that it took me to the cross. And when Jesus says, you will know a resurrection like mine, and you will see the glory I have given you just a glimpse of this morning, listen to him. For on that day, the day when we won't just get a peek at Jesus' face, but we will see him wholly and completely face to face, our sins will be washed as white as his clothes on the Mount of Transfiguration, and we will behold him exactly as Peter, James, and John saw him that day, glowing, dazzling, shining. And every tear will be wiped away from our eyes. But until that day, we journey with Jesus. We journey with Jesus to Jerusalem, to the cross, to the grave. And that journey doesn't begin on the top of the mountain. It begins when we get to the bottom. So let's follow. Amen. We sing together our hymn of the day. We will sing, What Wondrous Love Is This?
Even though we are apart this morning, we are together as the body of Christ in our confession of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we join in making a confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time we offer our prayers for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all, no matter what their need might be. Good and gracious Father, in the transfiguration of Jesus, we are reminded you loved humanity so much that you sent your only begotten Son to live amongst us, human and divine, physical and eternal. For only flesh could be crucified for our sin, but only your holy and perfect child could die for our salvation. Give us open and clear eyes to see your love on display across our world and use your church to be bearers of your love and light in a darkened humanity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Friend and companion, as these frigid temperatures set in, we are mindful of those who work outside, farmers and ranchers, utility workers, first responders, and the like. While we sit in the safety and comfort of our homes, we are mindful of those who lack access to heat or adequate housing, the homeless, the poor, the distressed. Warm those whose hands, feet, or hearts have gone cold. Thaw their frozen bodies and souls. Shield them from harm and give them a full measure of your presence and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, Moses and Elijah appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. Leaders and prophets of your people who bore witness to your Son. Give the righteousness and wisdom of Moses and Elijah to the leaders of our world, especially those here at home, that their words and actions might also bear witness to your son. Bless our President Joe, our Vice President Kamala, our Governor Kim, our Mayor Arlen, that they might be unwavering in their duties, standing up for the good of those entrusted to their cares. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of humanity, clothe in your brilliant glory and light all those who risk their lives to protect the innocent, defend liberty, and stand up for justice. Extend your hands to touch members of the armed forces, medical professionals, law enforcement officers. Hold these men and women in the palm of your hand, giving them your protection and shield as they go about their work and bring them home to their families awaiting their return. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of all mercy and consolation, your son Jesus is the greatest valentine we could ever receive. A note handwritten from you, that you have come to preserve and save us. Have mercy on all those who are sick, in distress, in danger, battling illnesses of mind, body, or spirit. Give them hope to wait for your moving in their lives. Give them faith to rise above their sorrow and pain. Give them your love as a shield. We pray especially this morning for Marcella Suter and Orva Willemson, both of whom are recovering from surgeries this past week, and with Marcella and Orv, all those whom we name in the silence of our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. In your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, we go upon our way this week to listen and to show and to tell, knowing in our ears and in our hearts that God loves us, showing his love to our neighbor and telling everyone about his immeasurable love for the world. And as we do this, we go forth with this benediction and blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 We sing our sending hymn, Beautiful Savior. Live in peace, listening to and believing God's beloved Son when he says, Your sins are forgiven, you are mine. Thanks be to God. Dear friends, have a warm and a wonderful week.